Hello and welcome to another VRTK live stream with me, the Stone Fox, and Jasmine from VR with Jasmine. Say hello. Hi, everybody. Happy Sunday. Yeah, it's Sunday again. It's that time again. The week goes so fast. Um, let's do uh, some of the housekeeping stuff quickly, just race through it so we don't waste too much time on it. It is important stuff, but um, I'd rather put the time into actually learning. So yeah, there's the uh, VRTK patron, patron.com slash VRTK. Feel free to join if you want. Um, do have to give a shout out to Tuka Takala, who is at the level to get a shout out on these videos. Um, so yeah, there's all that. Um, also as well, YouTube stuff, subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, all the things that YouTubers say. And also go and check out uh, Jasmine's channel on YouTube as well. The links are in the description down below um and hello everyone that's back in chat it's nice to see some regular faces yeah it's really nice thanks for thanks for hanging out with us on sundays be nice to build a little community and all learn together mm. um right before we actually get into what we're going to do this week so the uh the the title of this week's stream is uh let's build some like controllable things so controllable interactable objects last week we looked at interactable objects we could pick stuff up throw things around and we did have a little bit of a look at um the controllables we made something into a draw um but what we're actually going to do um this week is expand on those controllables a bit more and we'll look at making a bunch of things like levers doors wheels sliders all sorts of stuff like this but before we get into that what I want to showcase is a new uh, Unity asset that's come out in the week based on pretty much feedback and from doing these streams is a new uh, importer to allow you to import the VRTK V4 Tilia packages into your existing Unity uh, projects without needing to worry about editing manifest files and all the things that we've been saying over the past couple of weeks of you're going to have to get used to editing this text file. It just felt a little bit too much for people and a blocker. So that's one of the good things with these streams is we can put how it works, get feedback and then we can improve the product. So what I'm going to do just quickly to show you this, if I'm just going to create a new project in Unity. So if you just open up the Unity Hub, if you don't know how to create a Unity project, open up Unity Hub, there'll be a new project button up the top here. If you click that, select 3D, type in your project name, click Create Project. I'm not actually going to do this. This is kind of like uh, smoke and mirrors because I've, it takes about two minutes to create a new project. So I've got one already created properly professional and everything so this is a brand new unity project that doesn't have anything in and previously what we were saying with vrtk you'd have to go and open that manifest json file put in this to blah 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 blah, blah and people got lost so now what you can do is if you just go to the unity asset store and search for if you just search for vrtk now you'll see the old vrtk this is vrtk v3 so this is the old one People still use this, a lot of people still use it. Personally, I wouldn't recommend using this anymore because it doesn't work on newer versions of Unity. But we can also see this new asset here called the v VRTK V4 Tilia Package Importer. So if you click that and then it will say add to my assets, it might say download or something to start with for you. If you click add to my assets or whatever it says, it's asking me to log in. Um, hang on a minute, let me do that. Um, if I can remember my details. One moment, live streams are always fun. Uh, to Unity information. Um, right. Kind of broke my stride making me log in. Should have thought of that, shouldn't I? Rookie mistake. Right, back, back we are. Okay, so... Once I've logged in, now it'll say open in Unity. So if we click open in Unity, it'll then say, do you want to open it? Just say yes, open. Then over in Unity now. This is what I was saying, I think week one perhaps, is that the Unity asset store is something that's actually going to be going away in the future. So you can see what happens now when you open something in the Unity asset store. It actually opens in the Unity package manager. Um, and we can see that our asset is here in the Unity Package Manager. All we want to do is import this. So we just click Import, 
and then it will say this has dependencies and we just click another button so we're not having to type anything into text uh, text fields now we're just literally using unity's workflow and unfortunately i can't make this any easier because this is how unity expect you to do it now um so once that's downloaded and imported which should take no longer than 30 seconds hopefully <laughs> Yeah, Mike Underwood's pointing out the uh, the great thing in live streams. Things go wrong. Right, so once that's imported, we get this window appear, import the Unity package importer. So when we click import now, this will bring in that package, the Unity asset, into our project. And now we've got that in our project, we can see it down here. And in doing that, we get a new window up here in Tilia called the package importer now this version of the package importer um will is the first version that was released so when we click import here it opens the window and it automatically displays all of the packages uh that are to do with tilia so this is the first version it's already added in the manifest for us and it's already done all that stuff however this is already the old version of the software that came out like the end of last week um because since this has come out people have already come back with good ideas so i'm going to just quickly jump over to another project to show the absolute new mm. one that should get released this week when it goes through uh the unity asset store process so if you're watching the video now live and you go and get this in a minute that's what it will look like but if you're watching this in the future and um you like it doesn't look like that that's because it's been updated and it now looks like this so same thing again you go here you've got package importer but when we click package importer the first thing we get now is a message saying you don't have the correct scope registry in your project and that's because originally it was automatically adding the scope registry for you and i felt that was a little bit heavy-handed we shouldn't be forcing something onto the user we should let the user make that choice so now there's a simple mm -hmm. button of add scoped registry so you click that now and it adds a scoped registry for you and then we go back to the same thing we've got a couple of nice i love this this is so great and now we've got a couple of nicer things as well based on feedback one we've got a filter so if we just want to see the camera rigs we can type camera for instance and it just shows us the camera rigs if we wanted to find the interactables interactables or interactions it shows us them or if we wanted to add multiple things to our scene. So let's say we go, right, we're, we're going to be working on the, we use the XR plugin framework. We're going to use the tracked alias and we're going to use the new input system and we're going to do interactions. So we're going to have the interactables. We can select all of them and now click add selected packages. That will now go and add all those packages to our project. And we haven't had to open a single text file. So, that's something new that, as I say, was released last week based on the feedback from these streams. Um, this is awesome. This is, I mean, it seems like it's something so simple, but it does, it will, um, it will shave down time from people having to go back and forth between windows, having to copy and paste different things. And, and if you remember when we used to do our, um, our unity sessions and VRTK sessions, I'd, we would go through like 10 minutes of uh, debugging just because maybe there was some something messed up on the file on the text file. And that's the thing, just ha as we were saying earlier, just having a text file is enough sometimes to put somebody off doing something. You know, they'll look at it and go, Ugh. even if it's because I, as I was saying earlier, I had that conversation with somebody and they said, now I can use VRTK V4. And I thought, well, why couldn't, why couldn't you use it before? And they're like, oh, I didn't want to have to, it was too hard to install or something. And I was like, it was just changing a text file. And they were like, <laughs> that's too much for me. And, you know, it's kind of like those light bulb moments. And you think, you know, for me, it's so easy to just go and change one line in the text file. But for mm -hmm. other people, it's uh, it can be a blocker. And obviously the whole point of VRTK is to remove blockers. So now with mm -hmm. that as rinse, we can see now it's automatically brought all those packages in. So as before we get with VRTK, we get this menu. Every time we brought a package in, it brings in those mm -hmm. things. So, and when you want to add more, you can go back to Tilia 
and then to the package importer and it will only show the packages that you haven't already imported as well so because we've imported the tracked alias for instance we no longer see it in the list now if you want to update or remove packages the Tilia package importer won't do that for you you just use the normal package manager so if you go to the unity package manager there's no point in the Tilia package importer recreating functionality that the unity package manager already does so we can see here when these need it uh, updating you get a little icon on them there we're going to do this in a minute on the other project but you can update them here and remove them from here so the package importer isn't a replacement for the unity package manager it's just something that goes hand in hand with it so you don't have to mess about uh changing those text files just did you open the the package manager again yeah and while i'm doing that i'll just answer the question uh oh. in chat will it notify me when it updates on the store i'm not entirely sure how the unity assets i think the unity asset store if you've signed up for email notifications it will notify you when an asset that you've downloaded gets updated so i do get notifications on assets that i've downloaded and will you also update the discord the discord yeah the vrtk discord well i'll put it in there when it's updated yeah and i'll put it on twitter and things like that and i'll let people know but unity themselves will if you've downloaded that asset now and then when the updated version gets published which should be next week if you've signed up to unity's email notifications they will email you to say these assets that you've downloaded in the past have been updated so hopefully you will know when it comes out it should be next week it usually takes about three days once you've got an asset published onto the asset store for them to go through and approve any new changes so hopefully it'll happen soon so anyway yeah that's the uh the, the new yeah. package importer that's awesome i actually meant if you can open the importer oh right the importer take a quick look at it again Oops, so i opened the wrong thing mm -hmm. package importer so if you, what does the view do? That view oh, button? Oh, if you click view, oh, another couple of things actually, you can hover over them and it'll give you a little tool tip oh, telling you a bit of information about what it is and the latest version. And um, add adds it, that individual one to that. If you click view, it views the GitHub page to do with it. So if I click view on that one, um, let me bring up the browser. Where's my browser over here? So I'm not sure if this will work. If I view on that, no, it's going to the wrong browser. So there we go. So it basically, it just takes you to the GitHub page. But this mm. here, if we remember when we were looking at tilia.vrtk.io, this data is actually coming from this website or from the data that's behind this website. So all of the data on here is the same on here. So if you're used to using this, so you can see it says, uh spatial simulator camera rig blah 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 all that if we hover over this it says the same thing look camera rig prefab and the versions they match so this data is actually matching with this data it's the same it's the same uh, background data for both um so as i say if people are used to using this way and they still want to uh manage their manifests they can but if not, you can just use the package importer all the time. Now, the package importer will only work in Unity 2023 and above. And this uh, multi-selection thing only works in Unity 2021.2 and above based on the underlying systems of Unity it doesn't support things like that in earlier versions. So just bear in mind, if you're on an older version of Unity, if it's earlier than unity 2020.3 this isn't going to work for you so you're going to have to use the package manifest um file and if you do want to use the checkboxes you need to be on at least unity 2021.2 but you know that's uh, the most stable version at the moment so if you are new to this stuff you probably should be on the latest version in unity anyway um so that's that i guess we can move on from this now and go back to what we're actually supposed to be doing Mm -hmm. uh let's close those down right so where did we get to last time we got to we can teleport around our scene we can 
use a pointer teleport around our scene we made it so we could pick up these cupcakes we made it so we could pick up this pan and we made it so we could drag this drawer and move it in and out um the one thing i was going to do last stream uh, between last stream and this stream was go in and change all of the um origins on the model so we could actually just make this controllable but then i had another thought about it and thought well if i do that anyone following along isn't going to know what i've done and they're going to get lost so i've scrapped that idea and i figure what we'll do is we'll build some stuff in this scene just to show how it works and a lot of the things that we're going to be building um if we go onto the academy so a lot of the things that we're going to be building are actually already how-to guides so if you go down to the uh controllables we've already got a bunch of these here door draw lever physics button slider wheel artificial button so i'm just going to be building these i'm not going to go through the guide uh, i'll just build it kind of like off the top of my head um but if you do want to look at a more written down step-by-step -step guide these all do exist here um but before we do anything what we need to do is just update some packages because there have been some updates to uh, the Tilia packages in the week and I thought this would be a good opportunity to show how to update packages as I did mention earlier. So to update packages if we go to window and then package manager and then wait for that to fetch all the packages that are available in the project um, we can see as long as we've got it selected in project we can see all of our packages that need updating. These are Unity packages. A few of these need updating, but I'm not going to bother. We really just want to update the uh, the Tilia packages. So here we can see that these all need updating. If you select one, it tells you the latest version. So 1.8, uh, 1.5. And all you need to do to update them is you click on them and then just click update to. And then that will go through updates the package downloads the latest version and this is a great thing with the unity package manager i know a lot of people are so used to the unity asset store and downloading an asset and bringing in a new asset but it was somewhat of a pain to download updates of the asset you ended up having to pretty much like delete the asset off your project download the new one replace the old one and hope nothing broke Whereas the package manager, it handles all that updating for you. So you literally just click on them and uh, it will do it. And this is really cool as well, because we already saw that controllables actually depended on interactables. If you remember last week, controllables contain an interactable. So there's a dependency on this to this. So if we update this one, so we update that to 1.15 because this one has been updated as well that depends on that being updated so if you know that what depends on what you can save yourself some time here by once i've updated that one once it's done it's actually updated that one for us as well so we've got a tick oh that's great because unity's package manager knows what well, that depends on that so if you update that i'm going to update all the others on your behalf for you um, that's so convenient yeah so it means you don't have to as long as you've got um you know you know the, the flow what you're doing and you don't need to just directly start from the top and work your way down um it can make it easier and hopefully in the future as well unity will do things like adding checkboxes onto these so you can just check them all and then click update all that would be nice as well um but mm. that's all down to to unity basically they're going to be working on this um system and hopefully they'll make it better as we go right one more to update and then we can get into building some stuff for the rest of uh the stream there we go so everything's updated so that's it we're on the latest stuff updated now um so i think the first thing we'll build is a little lever so i'm just going to build a little lever over here so i'm just going to minimize all that down and um I'll show you another cool thing based on the stream again was if you remember last week when we were building the drawer I added a, a controllable in which was the linear drive and once that was in I then had to manually move the mesh and everything and it was a bit of a pain um, and when we created an interactable we just had to click a button so I thought well why can't we just do the same with the controllable so now if we go to um, Tilia 
interactions we've got the interactable creator but we've also now got the controllable creator and the controllable creator looks very similar you select what type of controllable you want whether it wants to be the linear uh, the linear joint drive the linear transform drive or whatever you select the one you want you select the mesh you want to convert to it then you click the convert button so we're going to be using this in a minute so i'm just going to dock this down here this is a great thing with these panels as well is let's say you want these out all the time so I want the interactable one as well for instance we can just dock them so we don't have to keep opening the windows we can just keep them at hand that's another great feature of the unity editor is we can just keep things at hand for us so i didn't know that based on all that let's now create a lever so first thing we're going to do is just create a game object that holds our lever uh for us so we're going to have a lever uh we'll just call it lever and this is what we can move the lever around in so this is the basis of it and then if you think about a lever we're going to make a stick basically that you can grab and pull forward and backwards and some sort of base that it's going to be in so if you think of like a lever we're just going to have like a, a ball for the base and then a controllable that is the thing that we can move forward and backwards so the actual ball part of it isn't interactable at all it's just kind of like the static base of it so within lever i'm going to create a 3d object uh, as a sphere and we'll just call this uh, lever base and now we'll leave that position at zero 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 but now we can move the levers position where we want it to go so if we bring this up here we can see this is actually a giant ball so what we'll do is we'll we'll scale down this base here so 0 0.1 0 0.1 0 0.1 um and again we're always going to leave this position here so it's nicer at its origin which is the issue we saw last week with this uh, model is the origins weren't very good um, we can position that probably halfway through and then if we want we can create a material to give this a different color so just on our assets we can create a folder for the materials to put them in so if we just create a new folder and call it materials learn how to spell and then in there if I just create a new material and we'll call it lever base and then we can just pick we'll just leave it on the standard shader and we can change its color let's have its color like a, a dirty ready brown and now there's a number of ways of changing this material we can either drag our material onto here or we can drag it straight into the scene so we can drag it there you can see wherever we touch him before we let go it's going to set it to be that color um so that's the base of it so now what we want is basically a stick that we can move like in a certain direction so we're just going to create a cube for our stick so a simple cube and it's huge so now we just need to make this smaller again so if we have our lever kind of that way so we'll have the x 0 0.02 uh, actually make it a bit thicker 0 0.3 and the z 0 0.03 now let's make it zero two. Zero three seems too thick. And then we want to move this up now. Um, so let's move. Actually, we don't want to move this up. What we can do is we can move our base down. So if we move our base down minus zero point one, and then move the whole thing up to about there. Actually, what we want is our le our lever to be just inside our base, so our origin kind of gets hidden in in there so we can move our base up just a little bit so 0.7 maybe and then we can move our whole thing down again and now our lever should sit within there so now if we rotate our mm. lever around the x actually that's going to be fine i think because what we can do now is if we call this lever uh, lever handle we'll call it and then we'll use that interactable creator so what we want here is this is something that's going to get rotated it rotates around a point we don't want it to move along one of its axes we want it to rotate around an axis so we actually want one of the uh, angular motions on this so it goes in a rotation and we can use the joint or the transform for this again i'm just going to go transform so if i select angular transform drive and click convert that's now done everything we needed it's turned that into the um the lever that we need 
and we can see what axis it's going to rotate around is its x-axis which is correct it's that one and uh, these are all the relevant values and now what we need to do is set the location of the hinge so the hinge at the moment will be at the center point of it so what we want to do is just set its hinge position to down here which is going to be half its height so half of 0 0.1 we can actually just do this minus 0 0.1 whoops one divided by two and that'll give us the correct one i mean obviously i could do that math in my head but if you've got more complicated things you can just type mathematic functions into these boxes um just question quickly uh, would it be possible to show how to make a joystick uh not going to do it in this stream um you can make a joystick this way but what i actually want to do at some point is make a prefab that's already a joystick so you don't have to worry about um doing any logic yourself you can just drag and drop something so it may be something that i cover in a stream or i just provide a prefab and show you how to use that prefab um okay so where did i get to right uh yeah so we've got this here we've set its um hinge location down to there and now what we want to do is set the limits of where this can rotate to so if we could rotate it 180 it could go all the way around here and all the way around there so we don't want it to go that far we probably want it to go to 90 would be completely this way and plus 90 would complete this way so maybe if we do 75 and 75 so let's say the minimum it can go is minus 75 and the maximum it can go is 75. if we now what direction are you get this to rotate and i'm having a hard time understanding so the axis that it's going to rotate around is its x-axis as we've selected here and the x-axis if we look on our widgets here the red one is the x-axis so this arrow is where yeah. it rotates around so if we were to rotate around the x you see it's moving like that but we've actually changed the hinge position so it'll actually do that sort of rotation but it'll do it around this bottom part. So what I'm going to do now is if I just stop this from being max, it'll make more sense in a minute. I cannot remember how to do this on game mode now. That's it, play maximize. I don't want to play maximize yet. What I can do is if we run the scene and I don't have VR set up, we can still mess about with these settings within the editor, how oh, it's going to go maximized. Okay. <laughs> Did Come you on. connect like the bottom of that? that handle to the origin of the of the spear or you just no, no, manually just, did it i haven't they're not anything to do with each other it's just says uh, kind of like uh I as, it. yeah just as a fake thing so if i okay. oh what's going on there that's uh doing some crazy stuff i think that is um a mesh issue let's just have a look at the mesh my lever handle is one one. Oh no, that's right. Yeah, so this should be one one, and this lever handle here we should have set to zero point zero two, zero point one, zero point zero two. That's right. Yeah, we should have we should have changed the mesh before we scaled it. You should never scale uh, the controllable, mm. otherwise you'll get weird things like that. And now we can see um in doing that we can actually see where the rotation is going to happen through see it's going to happen through that point mm -hmm. that's kind of like the spindle it'll rotate round. um i want to stop this play maximized uh play focused is that what i want it to be right so if we try this again and now we go over here and i just change this quickly we can we can actually mess around with these and watch our lever working so if i move this slider we can see that's the furthest point our lever will go to which is 75 degrees and if we put it all the way back the other way we can see the furthest our lever will go to is all the way over there and we can also look at that and say well our lever sphere is probably hiding a lot of our lever there we can probably move it up a little bit so we can do that quickly so we can move that to like 0 0.8 let's say and now what i'm going to do is i'm going to put the headset on and um actually try it in vr and show you with the, the hand so before i do that i'm just going to 
play maximized again. Hopefully my uh, headset is still connected to Oculus. Yeah, it is great. So if I go in and play. And then if I teleport over to this lever. So we've got the lever there now. And now I can grab the lever and I can actually move it. Hopefully you can see that. Is that looking all right on stream? You can see me grabbing yeah, the lever. Fine. Yeah, so, yeah, I was... I was thinking the same as Onukazi that if you had um, used the sphere as the parent and the cube is just attached to it, then use the sphere's axis of rotation. Um, but it wouldn't really make a difference since the sphere will look the same even if it's rotating. Exactly, it doesn't matter with the sphere. But the, I mean, you you yeah. could you could do that. You could put the sphere inside here, but you don't need to because this is just rotating around that point. The sphere is just there to hide mm -hmm. it, really. Um, and what we could do now yeah. is something like this. Um, we could have, uh, let's say, we'll create another game object, um, a capsule, for instance. Um, yeah, actually, but no, I think let's... it's just different ways to do uh, the same thing. Yeah, that's, that's pretty Based much it, questions. yeah. 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 <laughs> um, right, if I just bring this capsule in here, what we'll do now on this is I'll just show some of the events here. So... On here, now, if we open this up, um, we're going to have some drive value events in here. And if we look in the events output, we've got the minimum reached, the midpoint reached, the maximum reached. You can make as many of these as you like, but these are the ones that are given by default. So we'll say when the minimum is reached, when it's activated, we'll come, it will do about Zinnia actions in the future. But for now, um, just assume when this happens, it gets activated. So when this is activated, what we're going to do is turn our um, capsule collider, no, our game object, the capsule collider, we're going to set it to off. And when the maximum is reached, uh, we're going to add another event and we're going to set not that one. We're going to set our capsule collider's game object back to on. So... Now, when we go in here, if I come in and play again, and then teleport over to it. So if I drag this back to the maximum, it should be on. But if I go to the minimum, you see we're actually controlling oh. something with that lever now. And we can do, we can get even smarter with that as well, in that we actually do have other events on here. Um, and I think. I'll probably cover this stuff later down the line, but we've got, we can actually get the actual rotation value of that lever. So if we wanted to control, uh, let's say the opacity of this. So the more we pull the lever, the more opaque or transparent it becomes. We could do that as well. And there's these things called step values as well on the, um, mm. the drives. And you can, so at the moment we've got, um, what would the rotations be? It'd be 75 times 2. So what's that, 150? Um, so we've got 150 individual points here. Now, you might only want to care about like three points on your lever, like off, on, and midway, for instance. So what mm -hmm. you could do there is set a step range up. So that would be like 0 to 3. And basically, well, no, 0 to 2. And what that would mean is when you're roughly in this area, it goes, well, you're on step zero. When you're roughly in this area, you're on step one. When you're roughly in this area, on step two. Or you might have uh, five step ranges. So now you can have it so you can kind of like clunk the lever between different areas. And we could, if we do that, let's actually do it to just two because I'll show you this working then. And what we can do here is on the um, interactable object, that's inside that has its own events as well and what we'll say is when we let go of the lever what we're actually going to do is get it to snap to um its target value so first thing we want to do is on the interactable when we ungrab the actual lever we're going to then drag this into here and we're going to say um one of these here is uh set target value by step value which is what we want to use. And then when we set the target value by step value, we actually want it to just move to that value as well. 
um, so we want to turn on uh, move to target value we want to make it true and then when we actually grab it we don't want it to do that we want it to be free moving so when we grab it we actually want to make sure we set in move target value false so if we go move target value set to false right if I play this hopefully this will make a little bit more sense now so if I go over here and we grab this if I pull it down to here I've not pulled it all the way to get it off if I just pull it most of the way and let go, it snaps to the off position. If I pull it somewhat to the centre and let go, oh, it's actually, oh, it's not, there we go. It's picked up the centre position there. And if we pull it all roughly down to there, it should snap all the way down to the bottom. And we can actually improve the speed of it as well. Um, yeah, I was going to say, it's so slow. Yeah, there's uh, another option called drive speed. Um, so we can actually increase it, put it to 100. That might be a bit too fast, but doesn't really matter for this. Um, so yeah, when we ungrab, we want to set the target value by the step value. Um, and then we want to move to target value. So we just want to check that that's happening. Um, and we can also, as well, a good thing, we can also set the initial value that it's going to. So if we set its initial value, to being at its minimum. If I turn this on, it should automatically then go to one of the bar directions because it's already started at that position for us. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, even 100 might be a bit. But you see, we don't have to drag mm -hmm. it all the way down now to get it into the position. We can just put it near enough and it snaps back to this position for us. Yeah, looks like that lever has a lot of gunk in it. Having a hard time snapping quickly. Pardon? Uh, I said it looks like the lever has some gunk in it. That's oh, why yeah. it's having a hard yeah. time snapping quickly. Oh, and to, to fix it, we just keep bumping up the drive speed until it yeah. gets so it's like really, really snappy and it gets to where you need it to go. So, yeah. um, can you add? So, for this one, you're showing the x axis drive, and I know that that's what we set it to, but would you be able to do this for all the other axes? And then going back to the joystick point, is there like an infinite amount of like positioning that you could do? So, or is there something else you could use that's better, that's more optimized? Well, this, so um, yes, you can use this on multiple axes, but it's quite, it, you have to go in and like really kind of like fiddle about with it all. And whilst mm. I could go through and show that, I think what's better is instead of having that as that's a solution, if I build a proper multi axis prefab that you can just use um that's a better tutorial because then you can just say mm -hmm. to people here you go use this and you're ready to go um so let's move off lever quickly i'm just a bit mindful of time um let's build a, a door now so we've done the lever it's going to be the same thing for a door we're going to create an empty game object call it door and then we're going to create a simple door frame so another empty object we're going to call this door frame and then in here i'm just going to knock up a quick door frame with some cubes so this is going to be uh 0 0.1 by 1.8 by 0 0.1 and then let's just get this into a decent position um where's my door frame got there it is so bring this guy over here somewhere Move him up there. The other great thing about Unity as well is um, the numbers that you see in Unity over here, they're actually in meters. So that will be 1.8 meters high. So it's really easy to uh, like roughly figure stuff out. Unless you're American and you don't use meters, then it's probably really, really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, but it is it's, very difficult. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all in uh, metric meters, uh, Unity is. So... Um, we can move this just to the left a little bit. So if, let's say our door opening is uh, 70. So if we move this uh, minus 3.5 that way, and I'm just going to duplicate that and put it plus 3.5. Nah, that's going to be too small for a door. Let's do 4 and 4. And then let's just add a top part to that. So that's going to have nothing there. And then it's going to be 0 0.1 and across the x is going to be 0 0.4 0 0.8 that'll do i'm just going to roughly do this whack that in there 
That should be 0 0.9 then. So we've got a rough door frame here. Um, and now we want to add a door in there. So in here, if I just create another cube for our door, and we're going to have this a little bit thinner, so 0 0.08. And we know its width was 0 0.8. No, it's going to be less than that, 0 0.7. And then it's 1.75. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, sorry. that looks good. You can, you There's can... always a space on the top and the bottom, so yeah. it looks great. I mean, you can do the maths properly yourself, but for now, um, I'm just going to randomly do it. And we'll call this door. And now again, we're going to turn this into um, a rotator. So I'm just going to make this a little bit thinner. So it's actually this one, isn't it? The 0 0.6 will do. It's a little bit thinner in the door frame. So again, we're going to turn this into a rotator. So again, I can just use the angular transform. Or maybe we go joint on this one. So angular joint drive, click convert. We now have our joint here. Um, again, we need to work out where... Oh, I'll tell you what, actually, I've just noticed an issue with this. So what this is doing is it's actually copying the mesh size to the top thing, which works perfectly fine for an interactable, but not for um, not for a door, not, not for a controllable. So I need to fix that. So there will be an update for this to fix this. But see the way this is is 0 0.7, 0 uh, 0.176, 0 0.6, and then door is 111. So that's actually the wrong way around this. If I copy that, should be on the, the mesh. So we should paste it into here, which it's not going to let me do for some reason. I'll just do it manually. So 0 0.717606, 0 0.71.76, 0 0.6. And then this uh, should be 1.1.1. Um, have I made something too big? What have I done? How has that got to... How is that cube so big? What have I done here? <laughs> one, one, one. It's then... big in the Z axis. I know, but... Or is that the X, X axis? 0 0.1. Oh, maybe 0 0.6 is too big. It should be It should be smaller than 0 0.1. That's why. 0 0.06 it should be. There we go. Not 0 0.6. So, right. Now we're back to where we should be. So, yeah, that's a bug that needs fixing. So, um, we'll fix that. So... Uh, first thing we need to know is what axis we actually want to rotate around. Well, in this one, doors rotate around this axis, don't they? So we're going to change this to the Y axis because we actually want to rotate around the Y axis. And if you can't see the axis it's rotating around, we can actually change these figures down here. Oop, that's probably too big. Um, we can mess about with these. Uh, let's put that at two. Maybe we'll make that a bit smaller. So this, this line, now this yellow line, is showing us where the door is going to rotate around. Well, this door, if we rotated it now, would rotate like this. Mm. Because that's where the axis, we can see mm. it's going right through the middle, which is wrong. So what we want to do is we want to move that axis to the edge of the door. So the hinge location is actually going to move half the width of the door backwards. So the door width was 0 0.7. Um, so we actually want to move this minus 0 0.7 divided by 2. And you can see now our axis, this is what our door would rotate around now, this part here. And again, we can determine how wide our door can open. Can it open past uh, 180? Well, we'd probably want it all the way to 180, but it's certainly past 90. So maybe it can go um, one t uh, minus 120, but its maximum is zero. So we can only open this door one way. If we put plus 120 in, which we'll, let's do that to start with. We can actually swing the door both ways. Um, mm -hmm. So what we're also going to have now as another issue is our door frame is actually got colliders on it. And those colliders are actually going to aff affect the colliders on our door. They're going to be banging into each other. So the one thing we could do is just get rid of all our colliders off our door frame. And then there's no colliders to cause us an issue. The other thing. We what does it do, look like when it collides with it? It will just start glitching out. If I run it, we might be able to uh. see it do it. Um, let's run the scene. Because it's, it's probably a good idea to show that. So if we go over to the door and I can just grab the door. It's it's just getting stuck. Oh, okay. It's banging into the colliders of the the door frame. 
Um, actually, what I'll do as well is I'm just going to colour this. Let's just make the door brown. We'll use our lever base for the colour. Um, so what we can do is I don't think it's included yet. Uh, mutators, no. So the old fashioned way of doing things, go into our manifest and change it. Remember, you don't have to do this in the future because um, I don't have that asset in here. There is a package in here. I think it's in. Oh, yeah, it is mutate. It's called the collision ignorer. And if we copy the collision ignorer and then I just add that to the manifest. Uh, not that. Um, I need the manifest for this project, don't I? So if I just do show in Explorer. And then again, for people watching in the future, you no longer need to do this. But in the manifest, if I paste that in, go back here. And then when that's imported, the collision and aura is just a generic thing that we can get two objects that have got collisions within the system, just completely ignore each other. And in this, so you can imagine if you could walk around the scene and we'll cover locomotion in the future, you wouldn't want it so you could have no colliders on the door frame because you might be able to squeeze through the door frame or throw an object through the door frame because there's nothing for anything to collide with. Um, so you'd want like a cupcake, for instance, to be able to back it and uh, like bang into the door frame. But you don't care if the door's hitting the door frame. They can just ignore each other. Um, and it's it's a nice little hack to get around issues like this where things can annoy each other, where they don't really have any connection together. What you could do is spend ample amount of time making it so perfect that the colliders miss each other and stuff. But half the time it's not it's not worth it. So now adding that in, if we go to mutators and add in our collision ignorer, which is now up the top, the collision ignorer has basically got a source script uh, and a target script, and we just tell it the things to ignore. So we're going to say our door frame, uh, we can just drop onto there, is going to ignore our um, door. So this, all the colliders in here are going to ignore all the colliders in here. Simple as that. Now if we run it again, they shouldn't bang into each other. If everything has gone to plan. So, so the collision ignore it means that the like the collider is still there on the frame, which means you can't like walk through it. Yeah. It's just that these two items are now not interacting with each other the way they're supposed to. Exactly. This door completely ignores the colliders that are on here. So we don't have to make it perfect anymore. We don't have any jitteriness and stuff like that. But mm -hmm it it works and there's no need for them to to know about the collision of each other um if you wanted the door mm -hmm. to stop at a certain position let's say you want to be able to slam the door shut if i do that now you see the way the door just flings open so we can actually make the door stop i actually do have another video on this and i'm not going to go into a lot of detail on it now because uh, i do want to get um a wheel done if we can um, but quickly, what we could do, as I was saying earlier, if we only had the door open one way, if I just set the max to zero, for instance, and then we go in. Yeah, maybe any of the resources that you think would be good to dive into, you can just uh, add in the comments as a pinned comment later for people who want to dig into this more. Yeah, I can certainly do that. So now we can open the door just the one way. If I slam it, it'll actually... It, you can't push it past that if you see what I mean like I literally can't mm -hmm. so you know that's usually how doors work they only open one way but you know if you wanted to make a mm -hmm. swing door you just set the um the motion or the mm -hmm. angle difference and now hopefully this is gonna maybe work or not work if I just teleport over there I need to I'm teleporting onto the pan we need to cover rules at some point so this isn't possible um what I want to try to do is throw the pan into the door without punching anything. There we go. I can actually affect the oh, door wow. with the pan. And awesome. I, sh I should be able to push the door with the pan. Because this is a joint. And remember we talked about this before. The pan is um, a, has its own collider on. And the door is a jointed system. So it works within the physics system. Um, so you can have things that affect it look i can knock the door and then do it the other way but with our lever because the lever was just a transform system that's a great throw the lever is just a transform system the pan 
will actually have no impact on the lever at all. If we made the lever a, f uh, a joint angular driver, we'd be able to control the lever with the pan, so push it around. So that's a good example of um, the joint system versus the transform system. Sometimes you don't want physics to interact with things. Um, if it's mm. like uh, like maybe it's a game menu or something, it's configuration. You don't want it like a, you're holding something that accidentally is flicking switches for you. You you want to just do that yourself. So there is a reason for both of them. Um, right. So that's a door. So the next one we'll do is uh, a wheel. Um, I wanted to get more done than this. Maybe we'll have to do it in. Uh, could you use uh, Unity layers to prevent physics interactions? Yep, you certainly can. If you want, that's another way of doing it. You can use it. So Unity's got a, a layer system that you can say, I want these layers to work with this. Um, and that's perfectly fine. That works perfectly well. It's just another thing like that is one of those things that to some people feels like a little bit of uh, out of their comfort zone so they don't mess with it. So the collision ignorer is just there to make it very simple so people can just drag and drop a couple of things and it works but yeah you can absolutely use the uh the the collision layers matrix if you wish um right let's do a wheel i can actually move that mutator into that door because it's just to do with that door and this is a great thing with unity when you start just moving things into their own little game objects you can make your own you know nested little thing and then if you wanted you could make door a prefab and then put doors all over the place and you've made it once and when you want to change it you go in and just change that prefab of it um let's make a wheel so uh whoops wheel let's just move it out to the center a bit and again we'll just have like a, a base that the wheel hangs on We'll make this wheel a bit higher, so 0.5. Just move it over here a bit, and then uh, we'll just go with a cylinder for the wheel, I guess. Um, so new 3D object, a cylinder, and we'll call this wheel. And then we want to rotate this around the x-axis by 90 degrees and then we'll make the whole thing a bit smaller so 0 0.5 0 0.5 0 0.5 and then we actually want to make it thinner so 0 0.0 nope oh, that's because i've rotated this and it's this one 0 0.0 three two that'll do and this really doesn't need a base at all. It can just hang in the air, to be honest with it. We can see we've got a bit of a crazy collider because the sphere collider, uh, the, the capsule collider or the cylinder collider uses a capsule of the collider. So the collider is coming all the way around here. We don't actually want to do that. So I'm just going to remove this collider. Just add a box collider just for making it easier. You could add, you know, a, a custom mesh collider or do something here, but a box collider is going to be good enough. I'm just going to color this in as well. And again, our wheel is going to suffer now when we convert this because of that bug so we're going to use uh, another angular driver i'll do angular let's do angular joint again and i'm going to convert that and now this is wrong and the mesh is uh right so this is actually fine the position but everything else is wrong so if we go into oh you can actually do it here you can just do show interactable facade and then uh, down here, if we show mesh, go into there. So we've got wheel. So I've got to actually rotate this 90. I'll fix all these as we go. And then it's 0 0.5, 0 0.02, 0 0.5. So these can all go back to 1, 1, 1. And on here, 0 0.05, 0. No, is it 0 0.5, 0 0.02, 0 0.5? That's it. So that's correct. And then on here, our wheel axis now you can see it's actually trying to rotate around there which will make the wheel spin like this which isn't how we want our wheel to go we want it to spin around the z axis we want it to be like that so we need to change the drive axis to z and then our limit could be minus 180 to 180 so we can turn the wheel all the way to the left or all the way to the right 
but again limits don't have to be um just that we could do minus 720 to 720 so we can turn it like three times to the left or three times to the right um or you know you can make this number as big or as small as you want um and the hinge location on this is fine we want it to be right down the middle and we shouldn't need to change anything else on this if i just jump in now we should have a working wheel so there's our wheel if i go over to the wheel and it's not letting me grab it for some reason what have i done let me go and have a check why is this not letting me grab the wheel um is it because yeah again we're gonna have the same problem this collider is bashing into that collider so it's stopping it from moving i'm just going to turn this box collider off this is another way of doing it just turn the collider off so now nope it's still not letting me grab it for some reason the joys of live streaming um what have i done the hinge location is correct it's going through the middle just move this off angular joint wheel is correct the mesh is fine there that's all fine um position shouldn't matter there Somebody's asking, will Playmaker work with VRTK? There's no reason it wouldn't. For the old VRTK V3, somebody actually wrote a bunch of Playmaker scripts to integrate it. Um, there's nothing for VRTK V4 like that, but it, I don't know how difficult it would be to do. It should work. I mean, VRTK V4 is predominantly using the uh, Unity event system, so it should work. I cannot figure out what I've done here. <laughs> Why I can't it's get a this Playmaker. Through. Playmaker is uh, an asset for Unity that allows you to do what's called visual coding, where instead mm -hmm. of having to in type in coding yourself, it's you have like these um, kind of like blocks that you that represent mm -hmm. your code that then you join together with like links. Uh, so you mm -hmm. don't need to actually understand the code itself. You can uh, just use these links really. Um, right, what I'm going to do just quickly to show this wheel is so I'm just going to cheat and I'm going to the controllables. I, I must have done something wrong here um, because I'm rushing. Um, I'm just going to quickly create a transform drive and now my headset's dying as well. <laughs> One moment, <laughs> I'll plug my headset in. Um, be a bit clunky on the stream. One moment stream people. I think it's okay if we go over by a couple minutes. No need to rush. Yeah, that's fine. Just... Right, there we go. Headset plugged in. It's just I don't want to uh, overload. Um, right, so let's do this again quickly. So we've got this, we got this, we got this, we got this, we got this. I'm going to turn this one off, and all I'm going to do is I'm going to drag that and move it into this mesh container and then I can set all this back to zero and then we're going to put this into here and then I'm going to copy these and I'm going to paste them copy component and I'm going to paste it into this component component values and then I'm just going to delete this one and then again we want this to go around the z-axis and then minus 180 to 180 is fine. Um, that's definitely got a collider on you. Yeah? That's right. And that's all right. I feel like I'm uh, missing something, but I shouldn't have missed anything. That should work. Let's try this again. There we go. So I, I don't know what I've done with the joint thing, but we can see here that the wheel is now literally allowing us to turn. And if we spin it, it should stop at 180. And we spin it the other way, it stops at the other 180. Um, so, and again, if we were to put this down to something more like minus 720 and 720, it gives us a lot more 
freedom on that wheel. We can actually change those figures while the game's running as well. So I tend to stop it and change them and go back in. But if you've got the editor open, you can change those figures while the game's running. It should update. So now instead of just spinning it once, you can see the wheel spin a number of times until it stops. And then if we spin it back the other way, it'll probably run out of uh, momentum before it gets there. So I can give it another spin. And it will keep going until it gets all the way to its... There we go. It's got to its maximum. It won't go past that point now. We can spin it all the way back. And again, with um, all of these things, you get these values that tells you um, the specific bit of rotation it's at or the value change or anything like that. So we could do the same thing here. Do you remember we did with the, um, the lever? We turned that on and off. So what if we do something with this now? We do it uh, between minus 180 and 180 again. And we'll have a step value. We'll have five step values. So zero to four. Um, and then. Let's create uh, some objects. Uh, I'm just going to try this off the top of my head, see if it works. And then I think we'll wrap it up after that. Um, 0 0.1, 0 point. 0 .1. 0.1. Just want to show the uh, the slide value thing. Let's move this in so we can see it in a good position. So we're just going to create five of these. So one, two, three, four, five. Let's move them across. And what we'll do now is when the wheel is turned at a certain bit, it's going to turn them off, I guess. Um, so when the value change, when the step value changes, it actually exports a number for us um, of um, what that step value is. Now, there's a bunch of ways we can do this, um, but we know that number comes out. So what we could do on each one of these cubes, actually, let's create uh a logic thing here so logic and then in here we're gonna have five logic bits so we're gonna have cube logic um and here we know we need to take the number value which is our step number so that's a float so we want to actually turn that float um float to a boolean and this is another zinnia script um, is there a free or no limit option? You can put minus infinity to infinity in, which would spin forever um, as your your endpoints. That was a question. Like you write the word infinity? Yeah. So literally in here, you can do minus infinity to uh. infinity. Um, but I'll put them back for now. Um, right. So our cube logic is uh, we're going to turn this float to a boolean if the float is uh, between 0 and 1. But we actually don't want it to be 0 and 1 because it's only going to be, the step logic is going to be 0. So we'll have that 0. And then when it's transformed, it actually becomes a boolean. So now we need a boolean action. And again, I'm going to go into this in the future more. Um, for now, just assume that this stuff naturally works. And then what we're going to do is when we've transformed that, we're going to actually set this Boolean action. Um, Boolean action, we're going to receive the value that's passed in. So what's going to happen is when this step value changes, we're actually going to check to see if the value is between the, the, the bounds of zero and zero. If it is, we're going to set this, this action to true. If it's not, this becomes false. Um, and then when this is true, what we're going to do is we're going to turn on our first cube. And when it's not true, we're going to turn off our first cube. The game object set active. We can actually use a dynamic here, but I'm going to keep it this way. So we're going to turn it on and we're going to turn it off. And then in our drive on our step value changed, what we're going to do is when the value changes, we're just going to call that cube logic and we're just going to check we're just going to convert that float to a boolean 
And now what we need to do is duplicate this four more times, two, three, four. And then in each one of these, we basically just need to do it for each of the different cubes and the numbers. So that's one, one, and that will be for cube one and cube one. And then we need to just change these again. It will remember the ticks for us at least. And then here is two, two, and we're on cube two. Uh, do this. And then this one, I shouldn't have picked five, should I? Three, three, mm. cube three, <laughs> cube three. And then the last one should be four, four for cube four. Yeah, I think you could have de definitely demonstrated at this point with just three cubes, yeah. but that's okay. And I could have done it with a lever as well. Um, but right, we're done now. Anyway, so, and hopefully this is going to work. And what we just need to do now is just make sure we call all of those logics. Um, you don't have to group everything in here either. We can use what's called a proxy. And I'm not going to cover that now. Um, but in the future, I will cover it. And it makes keeping these events a lot cleaner. So you can just have like one thing in it. And all we want to do here is for each one of these, just call it uh, float to Boolean, do transform, float to Boolean, do transform on all of them. And that will just check every time the value changes, which one is um, basically when the value changes. So when that step value changes, it will go, are you between zero and zero? If you are, turn this cube on. If you're not, turn this cube off. Um, so if I run the scene, let's see if my logic has worked because I've just made that up from my head. So one step, they're actually doing it the opposite way. <laughs> there we go. Now it's working. Oh, they should all be off by default. That's why. But you can see now we're actually controlling based on where our wheel is. We can control the step value, which determines which cube comes on. And again, we've written no code, you know, in any of these uh, live streams so far, we've not opened up a C sharp file once, which is hopefully trying to, you know, show the benefit of uh, VRTK in that you can do so much without ever needing to write a line of code yourself. If you want to write code, you certainly can, and it and it works into that stuff. Um, but you you can do so much without. Yeah, um, now you don't even have to open a text file. Yeah, it's even easier now. You don't even have to type on your keyboard at all. You can just do it all from your mouse. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else quickly. The one thing I could show quickly is actually turning this. At the moment, you've seen that we were using this as a wheel, where I was grabbing it by the edge and I was actually, you know, you physically turning it as a wheel. Sometimes it's nice that instead of having to grab it at the edge and turn it, you can like use it as a dial. So if I just make this really small, this wheel really small, like 0 0.1, 0 0.1, so it's more like a dial. So let's say this was like a, um, you know, a, a dial on a TV or a microwave or, you know, whatever. You, the way you'd want to use this is grab it there and then turn it like that, wouldn't you? That's how you'd think to use it. But it doesn't work like that. It's a pain. You still have to grab it at the edge and, and move it around like that, which is somewhat annoying. Um, let me just turn these cubes off so it actually does work properly. Yeah, they should be off by default. So what we can actually do to make it work like a dial is we can actually uh, customize it a little bit. If we go into here, um, the follow tracking, we can change the interactables uh, follow tracking. You remember before we only looked at follow transform and follow rigid body? And we didn't look at any of the others. Transform meant the object passed through things. Rigid body was like the frying pan where it would bang into things. Well, this one's actually doing one of these ones. We can actually do this one, which is rotate around the angular velocity of the controller. And again, it sounds very mathematical and whatnot. Um, and the velocity we want to rotate around is the Z axis. I believe it's a Z axis we want. Um, so just doing that, changing it to that and that hopefully it's been a while since i've made a dial so i could have this wrong but hopefully there we go we can actually just rotate it oh actually it's moving around because we need to turn something else off as well um 
we need to turn off uh, the movement. Uh, da, 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 da. Or is it just that? Do we put that to none? I can't remember now. As I say, it's been a while since I've created a dial. So, uh, there we go. Yeah, just set that to none. So now, instead of having to grab it at the corner and drag it around, I can just put my controller into centre and then just turn my wrist like an actual dial. You know, so we've got, you know, so it's more like, I don't know, like a volume knob or something, you know, rather than a wheel that I have to spin around. Like a, one's more like a valve that you have to turn and the other one's like, you know, like a, a volume dial or something. And there we go. We've, we've created a bunch of stuff in... Um, bunch of different things from a lever to a door to a wheel to a dial without writing any code um let's just see what some of these questions are before we move on uh god chat's moved too fast for me so yeah unreal blueprints working with nodes yeah that's like playmaker um use this for an escape room yeah absolutely so you can see how easy this is to like build an escape room like you could have when i've pulled the lever down open a door you know trigger something else it's all based on actions and events you know i do something this then happens so you can you can easily build an escape room or even if you look at a game like job simulator a lot of job simulators mm -hmm. functionality is this sort of stuff isn't it it's press a button pull a lever grab something, throw it around. So, you know, these sorts of things you can put together um, pretty rapidly without needing to know, you know, any code at all, really. Um, so that's really useful. Uh, trying to think last time I saw a dial on a TV. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Showing my age there. Um, what else? Bit of a question. Can you call functions from other packages using VRTK's no script? Yeah, any absolutely anything um that has a method that works within the unity event system can be called from within here so that's that's doing that already so uh i tell you what here's a really cool idea let's go over to the lever again and do you remember in the lever we were having this turn on and off based on when it got to the midpoint and there so it turned it off and then it turned it on well instead of that how about we do this we create uh another material called on and we'll make that green and we have a material called off and we'll make that red and then what we'll do is in our minimum point reached we won't change the capsules game object we'll actually change the capsules mesh renderer which is just another compa uh, component and we'll change its material property there. I can't remember which way round this is now. So I'm going to say minimum is off. I could be wrong here. And we'll say here, we'll change the mesh renderer's material to on. So now when we run the scene, what should happen is that's in its off position. So it's red. And when we move it there, it goes green. So... You instead of just turning something on and off we can control whatever we want with that event it's an event that happens when we perform an action when we put that all the way over to the other side an action occurs it's as simple as that um so yeah you can call other things as well if you need um right I've, i need to take my headset off because it's starting to hurt my head one moment can you still hear us yeah, I can or hear me. You now. I can balance, um, balancing my headset on my head uh, gives my neck ache. <laughs> so mm, now I've finished doing so, VR stuff, I can sit without it. So you were saying earlier, like way earlier in the stream, that for like a joystick or um, things like that, that you could just do a prefab. So what's the difference between like a prefab versus what we've created now? So if so, this is it's an automated prefab effectively the lever is a prefab that we've just configured some options on if we wanted to mm. make this work with multiple axes what we'd have to end up doing is drilling all the way down into actually that's probably not the best one to look at which is the joint one i did didn't i make one into a joint it was a door wasn't it 
Mm -hmm. um, you end up having to drill down here and then start changing all things on here. So that probably wouldn't be a hinge joint. You'd use a character joint there. So you end up having to mess around a lot with the internals of the prefab to get it to work, which you can do, but it's not very user friendly. Um, so what I would end, what I would suggest instead is we at the moment we have uh, a linear drive and an angular drive. Um, I would also suggest we have uh, like a, a, I guess like a, a limb drive or something like a character joint type drive that does allow you to move something in multiple axes. So you select your thing and then just click a button and it adds it all for you. So you don't have to do any work and stuff out yourself. Um, people have made joysticks um, within VRTK. It's just it's not super duper user friendly at the moment. You have to go in and start kind of adding your own stuff. Um, and you could you can do it yourself using the Unity Joint System again, but you then have to understand the Unity Joint System. What I want from VRTK is you just be able to literally select something, click a button, and it and it's there for you, so you don't have to do any figuring out. So when it becomes a prefab, it will be like you know what we've done with the door here. We didn't have to we didn't have to understand any of the joint system in Unity. All we had to do was make it that, and then we had to just change a couple of things on here. We had to say what axis do we want it to rotate around, and where do we want our hinge position to be, and what do we want the limits of our door. That's all we had to do. And I want the same sort of thing for a joystick. You just go, I want a joystick. I want these to be the limits, and that's that. And then you also get all these additional events because all these events aren't, uh, these are all provided by VRTK. So all the value change stuff, that's all VRTK stuff. If you did your own joystick, messed around with it, you'd lose all of these, you know, nice things. So I want all that in there as well, basically. Where can you get these prefabs? Are they at the VRTK website? Um, these ones are, yeah. So this is, these ones are in the controllables package. Um, that we included last week uh, when we added the draw. So. Oh no, uh, I meant like um, you said that someone's already made a joystick that's prefab. Oh. You already get those. That no, that will be some somebody's made it for their game, so it will be included in their game. Whether they've released it live mm -hmm. or not is I, I don't know, but there's nothing that I know of that there's nothing official in VRTK um, that you can just use. But there that is something I do want to build. So that will be coming in the future. So if you do want joysticks and you don't have to build it yourself, like to build a joystick isn't that complicated. It literally is mm -hmm. in Unity. It's um, They give you a character joint. So it's this character joint and it allows you to move in certain angles, but you have to then start understanding all the joint system, how you interpret that data and all that sort of stuff. Um, and what you can do is you can use the, the VRTK's interactable object that's rigid body tracked with a character joint to know where it can move to. But then you have to then work out what position it is, how to calculate all that data into all the different axis values and everything like that. So it's a bit more of a pain to do. What I want to do is make it so it is just literally, you drag it in and it's super simple to use. You don't have to do any of that thinking yourself. Um, someone's asking, is it possible to adapt VRTK Atelier into augmented reality scene? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's nothing in VRTK um, V4 that really is for even VR. I mean, you can you can do all of this stuff. Um, just in a standard 3D scene, it doesn't even have to be VR. So this door still works even if you're not in um, VR mode. And you know we showed that earlier. If I go back to, uh, how do I stop it from playing maximize play focused? If we go back into here and run this, although the game scene will be in VR, we could easily disable that camera from being VR. And then on the door, we could, uh, you know, just change the the target values ourselves. You can, you can see we're controlling the speed of the door or the, the position of the door. And if we up this as well, you know, we can make it move faster. I've glitched it out a bit there. So we can do things like that um, completely outside of VR. So, yeah, it worked it work for augmented reality or wherever you want to use it, really. 
Are there any other questions before we wrap up this stream? Anyone else in chat? No? Okay, I hope this has been uh, useful. I know it was this kind of fun. whistle stop. Do you know what the plan is for next week? Um, I do want to get into doing the snap zones and things like that. Mm. I wonder if it's worth covering a couple more um, controllables at the start of mm -hmm. next week. I mean, realistically, though, other things that you can build, as I say, they're all included in here. So I wanted to do things like a slider and a button and things like that. But if you go here, this covers all this. Like The slider's pretty cool. If we go to the end, you can see basically it's like you know, like a volume slider type thing. You can drag this around and it actually changes the colour of this. Um, and if you want to create buttons, uh, you know, there are things here you can press it down and it works with a button. So, um, probably we move, up, we move on from controllables because it's all, a lot of that stuff's covered here. If you do actually want to know how to build an actual door, with an interactable handle that's something i haven't covered now because it starts getting a little bit more complicated um but it's just a controllable the door with another controllable the handle and i do actually have a video on the youtube channel that shows how to do that and i'll put a link in the description to that down below so if you are interested in exploring these controllables into a more detailed way i'll stick that video in the description and you can go and watch it and it literally is a, it's a door that you have to pull the handle down to open the door and then when you close the door if the handle's up the door will slam shut if the handle if you've still got the handle down it won't lock you know it's got like a, a fake locking mechanism and everything in there and it's all done without code you know so you can you can go and explore that. And then if you look at the uh, VRTK farm scene example as well, um, you can see examples of controllables nested within controllables there as well. Like you've got the shotgun, which is a controllable for the pump that's attached to an interactable. So you can do really clever and complex things with them. Um, so that if you are interested in exploring this stuff more, definitely go and check that stuff out. But yeah, for next week, I think if we do snap zones, because um, that's quite useful to do. So maybe we do snap zones and something else, perhaps, because snap zones sh shouldn't take too long. So I'll, maybe we can do snap zones and um, snap zones and haptics, perhaps, because that's something we haven't covered yet. Of like how, if I grab a door or something and I want to move the door or I pick something up, or I touch mm -hmm. something, maybe I want the controller to buzz to know I'm touching it. Um, so, yeah, uh, Mehdi there saying, uh, would like to see in the future how to have stack stackable interactions, like Chef Games or your Builder Burger. So that's really good for next week, the snap zone. So a snap zone allows you to do that. You have one item, you snap another item onto it, and then you snap another item onto it, and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, we'll be covering that next week. So you'll be able to see how you can do that stuff. Yeah, sounds great. Um, let's see if there's any other questions from chat. If not, uh, we can wrap up. Give them a Thanks few Thanks for seconds. joining us, everybody. Yeah, it's great to see people back again. Hopefully, um, as we go, we'll build a bit of a community and... Uh, mm -hmm. People will start being able to help each other out. Don't forget as well the VRTK uh, Discord. If you do want to learn learn any more about uh, VRTK, just go to community.vrtk.io. It'll take you to the Discord chat. Um, Jasmine's got her own Discord as well. If you wanted to learn more about kind of like more VR hardware, VR ecosystem, uh, mm -hmm. Jasmine's Discord's great for that. And obviously, uh, youtube channel which there's a link in the description down below for that that's more about the the wider ecosystem stackable hats yeah we could do <laughs> you could do stackable hats um and you can actually you know a snap zone can go anywhere so you could put a snap zone on your tracked alias headset so you could st stack things onto your head so yeah it's totally possible actually i did do um i mean it was in the old version of vrtk v3 um I made uh, a Christmas 
game thing for it called Seasons Greetings. And you could actually go up to the snow. Well, you could roll your own snowmen out of snow and then put a hat on them. But you could also pick the hat up and put it on your own head and then walk around with the hat on. And I think you could pick the wreath off the door as well and put the wreath on your head, if I remember. Um, that's on itch.io. I'm not entirely sure if it still works, but I can put a link in the description down below if people want to go and have a play. It was it was free, so you don't have to pay for it. But I don't even know if it works anymore, so we'll find out. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably it then, isn't it? We don't need uh, to cover anything else. Anything else from you you want to cover? No. This was a great session. I hope everyone... I'm excited to see everyone's escape rooms in the future. That'd be cool. If next week we come back and people have got some escape rooms, maybe drop <laughs> us a, a message or something and, a, and we can like spend 10 minutes checking out people's escape rooms or something in the stream. Um, yeah, that'd be great. That would be fun. So yeah, maybe that's something else we could do in the stream moving forward. If, if uh, you folks in the stream want to like build something within the week or something and the things that you've learned, send it over, you know, whether it's on Twitter or YouTube comments or Discord. Um, and we can, you know, like spend 10 minutes in the stream just checking out like user content, see what you've been making. You know, that's that's a great feedback loop. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining. See yep. you all next time. Yeah. See you next time. And bye for now. Bye.